Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. Natural limestone caverns can be spectacular. Here's a wonderful example of one, Cathedral Caverns State Park in North Alabama. I've been there many times. I grew up not far from there. The limestone you're walking through in a limestone cave represents the geologic history of that cave's formation itself, but also the limestone that was there first. The limestone that was laid down originally, millions, hundreds of millions of years ago, in many cases, in ancient seas, oceans, where phytoplankton, foraminifera, other forms of marine life, reef-building organisms, extract calcium and carbonate from the ocean water to build shells of calcium carbonate. It's a mineral shell that survives the death of the organism. It doesn't rot away like the biomass of the organism typically would in the oceans. The shell, as the organism dies, as the phytoplankton dies, its shell will fall down through the water column of the ocean to collect on the bottom, be it shallow or deep, and you build up a reservoir of carbonate sediments. Compressed over time, carbonate sediments become solid limestone rock, and when uplifted on the continents, groundwater percolating through cracks and fissures in the limestone can produce caves by dissolving the material. Limestone isn't just spectacular to look at in caves or to collect fossils from. It also represents the largest reservoir of carbon in the Earth's crust by far. There's a vast amount of kerogen in sedimentary rock stored away in the crust. There's carbon in the oceans, in the atmosphere, in the biosphere, elsewhere. But the biggest reservoir of all by far is calcium carbonate limestone. A great deal of the carbon dioxide that's been emitted by volcanoes over the history of the Earth now exists in limestone, essentially trapped away for the rest of geologic time or something close to that. A lot of the CO2 that volcanoes emitted over time is now in the form of limestone because we have oceans where animal life and phytoplankton convert calcium in the oceans and carbonate from atmospheric CO2 into solid materials. So limestone begins in the atmosphere and it begins in the calcium of mountain ranges on the continents. So let's go back to basics, and I want to talk about some aspects of how limestone forms chemically. And I'll keep the chemistry short, but it is necessary to understand this, at least to this degree. The way you get limestone is that you get carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dissolving into ocean water. And the dissolved gas, CO2, takes on a different molecular arrangement than in the atmosphere. In ocean water, it takes on the form of carbonic acid, now, that dissolved carbonic acid in the form of bicarbonate will react with minerals and etch them. It is an acid. It's a weak acid, but acids still etch minerals. Limestone dissolves readily, but even silicate rock will dissolve in the presence of carbonic acid very slowly. It won't fizz when you trickle a little bit of weak acid onto a piece of quartz, but there is a reaction going on at the microscopic level where the minerals of that piece of sample, the minerals of a rock, the continental mountains, the granite of the continent, is slowly corroded by carbonic acid. And over time, the effect adds up. Across the continents, the granite mass of the continental crust, the highest mountain ranges, subduction-related volcanism, for example, producing mountain ranges, continental collisions, high mountain ranges that readily begin to erode, rainwater, wind action, river, slowly but surely eroding the rock physically and chemically, sending dissolved components to the ocean. In our case, we're concerned mainly with the calcium, which exists in granite and in intermediate felsic volcanic rocks. Therefore, if you were to chemically weather, for example, a calcium silicate such as this CaSiO3, which represents technically the formula for the mineral wollastonite, but here just represents the calcium component of some other silicate mineral present in the rock. Calcium dissolves, goes to the oceans. The silica just precipitates elsewhere. It doesn't really concern us here. It will transport in water and precipitate either in the ocean or as sediment in rivers. It just tends to just plate back out as a solid elsewhere and doesn't really bother us in terms of climate. Meanwhile, calcium and dissolved bicarbonate in ocean water, the bicarbonate that originally derived from the air, CO2, those two things will combine by the agency of biological organisms. There's a lot of organisms in the ocean that have long ago learned the trick of catalyzing the formation of calcium carbonate on their tissues. Everything from as small as a single-celled foraminifera 
to mollusks, coral building organisms, and calcareous phytoplankton. All of these organisms remove calcium and carbonate from the water, forming carbonate sediments, which eventually can become limestone. This means that over geologic time, carbonic acid weathering of continental granitic rock via, once the calcium gets in the oceans, via the agency of shell building organisms, removes carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. Over geologic time, this is a major drawdown, although day to day it's not very much. Remember, we're talking about pieces of the carbon cycle that involve the longest time to make a difference. Typically on an annual basis, only about 0.03 gigatons of carbon is extracted from the atmosphere and goes into limestone, which goes into long-term geologic storage. It adds up there and has added up to be the largest carbon reservoir of all on our planet. But day to day, year by year, it's a very small drawdown. Nonetheless, numbers add up even when they're small. And even at that slow rate, the drawdown of CO2 from our atmosphere by shell building organisms through the process I just described would completely exhaust the atmosphere of CO2 in less than a million years or something on that order. It wouldn't take long. So we've had CO2 in our atmosphere over geologic time, and it hasn't gone away. So if we're constantly, slowly but surely, stockpiling away all of that carbon with the calcium in our crust, how do you get the carbon back in the atmosphere? Well, here's how. eruptions always produce some CO2, either derived from the mantle or, in the case of subduction-related volcanism, derived from organic matter and limestone on the ocean crust, collected there over time. And as ocean crust subducts beneath the continents, it heats up, it begins to break apart at depth, and melt to produce magma chambers, resulting in subduction-related volcanism and mountain building, and CO2 release. The carbon that was originally stored temporarily on the seafloor in deposits of limestone or organic sediments is returned to the atmosphere through subduction-related volcanism. So this closes the loop. This closes the cycle of how carbonate and silica interact over geologic time. Volcanism produces CO2 or releases it back to the atmosphere. Then continental weathering, the weathering of continental granitic rocks, will remove CO2 from the atmosphere, weathering away calcium, and dissolved carbonate in water to the oceans, where that calcium and that carbonate is turned into limestone and stored for geologic time. And one of the surprising things we've learned from studying how climate works on our planet is the realization that over geologic time, this carbonate silicate geochemical cycle operates as a thermostat for our planet. Let me explain how this works. So let's imagine a scenario where the sun unilaterally brightens for some period of geologic time and this would tend to warm the planet. The temperature of the planet would tend to go up. Now, how does the carbonate silicate geochemical cycle respond to this? Well, if you increase the temperature of the planet unilaterally by some external process, then by increasing temperature, you're generally going to do a couple of things. One is you're going to generally tend to increase the amount of precipitation around the world, amount of evaporation from the oceans, and that's going to create more water vapor in the atmosphere. It's going to warm the atmosphere you're going to have more precipitation and more weathering. With more rain, more freeze-thaw, you get more erosion of continental granite. And at higher temperatures, weathering reactions actually go faster. They're chemical reactions, and many chemical reactions will accelerate at higher temperatures. So a warmer planet has increased rates of chemical weathering, 
And at the same time, volcanoes don't care what the weather is. So the more weathering you have in a warmer world, you're going to be taking more calcium to the oceans, forming more limestone, but impoverishing the atmosphere of carbon because the return carbon path is subduction and it's not slowing down or speeding up based upon the weather. In that kind of world, the result of a unilateral warming of the planet will be a response over a few million years, but a response by the carbonate silicate geochemical cycle that will tend to cool the planet back. More weathering is more limestone delivery to the oceans at the expense of atmospheric CO2. So the thermostat effect is a negative feedback in this case. Warming the planet results in a chemical response in the environment, in the atmosphere, that will tend to bring temperature back in line. Well, what about the opposite situation? What if you were to unilaterally cool the planet? Let's say we pass through a part of the galaxy with lots of dust, uh, or the sun dims for a while for some reason, having nothing to do with this scenario. If the world were to unilaterally cool, how would the carbonate silicate cycle respond? In a cooler world, you have drier air, typically. In a cooler world, you have less evaporation from the oceans, less precipitation, and the rate of continental weathering will generally tend, on a worldwide average basis, will tend to diminish. With less weathering, you're removing carbon from the atmosphere more slowly, and again, volcanoes don't care. The rate of subduction return of carbon to the atmosphere is going to go apace, and if you slow the weathering rate in a cooler world, you allow more CO2 to build up in the atmosphere. Your limestone production rate diminishes, because you're delivering less calcium to the oceans, you're robbing the atmosphere of carbon more slowly, and the thermostat effect kicks in. In a unilaterally cooler world, carbonate silicate cycle will tend to respond by dragging the temperature back up, by increasing the CO2 concentration and moderating global temperatures in that direction. So in both cool and warm directions, the carbonate silicate cycle really does control the climate of our planet over very long time scales. And the thing is, over geologic time, there really is a unilateral influence on solar intensity. The sun itself, as it ages, as it goes through its main sequence life, slowly expands in volume and brightens. Over the course of the last four and a half billion years that the Earth has existed, the sun, in fact, has increased in brightness by about a third, roughly about 30% increase in brightness since the Earth and the sun formed because of the sun's slow brightening over the course of its life. This is a predictable clockwork process that nobody can do anything about. That's just how stars work. Now, combine that with the fact that we can look at the geochemical history of our planet, and we can look at rocks from a very long time ago, two, three, up to four billion years old. Remember the zircons of the Jack Hills of Australia? Oxygen isotopic data from these zircons that date to over four billion years show us that the Earth at that time was about the same temperature as it is now. Somewhere in the range of about 15 to 20 Celsius temperature at the surface of the Earth. Today, the average temperature of the Earth is about 15 Celsius. Over the last four billion years, climate has shifted a lot up and down. We've gone through a few phases of deep freeze where the planet nearly froze over completely. And climate has been warm, such as during the Permian and during the Cretaceous during the Carboniferous periods. But within a fairly narrow range, temperature has not varied much. It's gone up and down with a few excursions to the cold, but it hasn't really swung a lot. So you could say over the course of the last four billion years, we have seen the climate of the Earth essentially remain more or less in a same homeostatic temperature range, while the sun has increased in brightness by about a third. Now that has to be explained. How can the sun increase in brightness by that much? And yet the temperature of the Earth doesn't really respond very much to that. From what we can tell, the CO2 content in air over the course of Earth's history has trended downward fairly steadily. There's a lot of noise, nature is messy, but the overall trend has been toward lower CO2 concentrations over long periods of geologic time. Again, we're not talking about the modern day. This is not about anthropogenic climate change. Modern climate change, the entire history of our species on this diagram wouldn't even register as a tenth of a pixel. So this is not about today. This is about the long-term status and trends of the geochemistry of our planet. Over the last four and a half billion years, CO2 trends down as the sun brightens trending upward. The carbonate silicate geochemical cycle is essentially creating a thermostat effect, which keeps the temperature of the planet within a fairly narrow band normally, while the sun brightens and the air CO2 goes down. And a natural thought that might occur to you at this point is, well, that can't go on forever. And no, it can't. This diagram illustrates biological productivity relative to today. That's on the y-axis as a function of time in billions of years. At zero is today, plus one is a billion years from now, minus one is a billion years ago. 
Biological productivity is measured relatively in this diagram. Today is one. It is 100% of what biological productivity is today. We suspect that biological productivity from most of the past billion years or so was higher actually than today. Even before there were land plants, we had marine algae, we had phytoplankton, we had macroalgae in the oceans, and that is photosynthesizing biomass that is pulling down CO2 using sunlight to do it. We suspect that the Carboniferous, for example, was much more productive than today. And much of the Earth's past probably was, trending downward in productivity as we go toward the modern era. One reason being the atmosphere CO2 is constantly going down as the sun brightens and the thermostat of carbonate silicate cycling maintains temperature. So what happens in the future? As time moves forward, the carbonate silicate cycle will continue to leak carbon out of the atmosphere, dragging it down closer and closer to zero. And when you reach a minimum of about 10 parts per million CO2, a lot of vascular plants just can't function anymore. They can't pull that tiny trace amount of CO2 out of the atmosphere to make a living. So effectively what's going to happen in the distant future, hundreds of millions of years from now, as CO2 trends to zero, the biosphere is just going to wind down like a cheap watch. We're going to lose biomass productivity as the air becomes poorer in CO2, and eventually the biomass of the biosphere will decline to nothing. It'll look almost like a replay of the Earth a billion years ago when the most advanced life forms were stromatolites, algal nodules of cemented sediment in the ocean. This is not good news, but it is, but it does inform us about how planets work, how carbon cycles and biospheres will tend to operate. Our biosphere has an expiration date. Anywhere from about 200 to 500 million years in the future, we're going to see the biosphere wind down. This is an unexpected finding, and it has come from studying modern climate in the modern era and trying to understand it. But as in science, when you study one thing, you might discover some new things that you didn't know were there. And this is a pretty big thing that we didn't know was here until fairly recently.